Another big word. And physical anthropology means the study of human origins. It is a field that throughout history has been heavily influenced by subjective factors, perhaps more than any other branch of respectable science. The problem with physical anthropology is it is begging for confirmation either in the fossil record or any living creature. But the pressure to try to find evidence for early man, the so-called missing links, is so severe that it has led to a lot of fraud. The origin of mankind. What did the first man look like? It's often portrayed by a series of pictures, such as this clip art, which shows knuckle-dragging creatures coming out of the jungle, gradually becoming ape-man, and then man. But I do believe in one form of evolution. Some of us have incurred that kind of evolution. However, we did not change species. We're still the same, just a little more preponderance around the waistline. Dr. Derek Ager, who was formerly president of the British Geological Association, he admitted the following. Practically every evolutionary story that he learned as a student in school has now been debunked. And such is the case with many so-called prehistoric men. I would like for you to do something. I am going to pass out a piece of paper to you. I would like to collect this. I would like for you to draw the tooth that I obtained in rural Tennessee. I would like for you to draw what kind of creature you think that came from. Well, I have some interesting pictures. I have some men. Some women, a dog, a monkey. Big, this dog got big floppy ears. This looks like a prehistoric. Some well, I happen to know that it was my brother's wisdom. From just one tooth, you really can't tell. Now, the reason why I had to do this is I wanted to impress upon you the fact that the evidence of many of these prehistoric so-called men is not much more than just a tooth or a piece of bone or something like that. Ramapithecus. How much evidence did they have for Ramapithecus? That's supposed to be one of the earliest, quote, prehistoric men. They had a few teeth, fragments of a jaw. They now think that it was an extinct form of an orangutan, which is a kind of an ape gorilla type creature. An orthodontist has showed that the angulation of the jaw, if you have a whole jaw, you really can't tell whether it's a man or an ape because you have such a variation. This orthodontist took molds of people's teeth. He shows that the human jaw, lower jaw, of his patients can be almost, or the teeth are almost parallel to the bottom teeth being like 65 degrees. The range of tooth variation, angulation, is so wide that you can't tell from a human. Now, Nebraska man. All the evidence they have Nebraska man, and by the way, Nebraska man was supposed to be the first human being that they had discovered in the Western Hemisphere. What evidence did they have for it? They had one tooth, and that was supposed to be evidence of first man in the Western Hemisphere. They took that tooth, they sent it to Fairfield Osborne. He was a specialist, and I believe he was with the Smithsonian Institute. The field geologist who found this was named of Harold Cook, and so he got his name in the name of this. The technical name for Nebraska man is Hesperopithecus Harold Cookie. Well, he got some fame for a little while, until four and a half years later they discovered that it was the tooth of a wild pig. Prior to that expose, they thought it was halfway between Java man and the... Now from that one tooth, before it was exposed, this is the drawing that circulated worldwide. This started in the London News. They drew a, quote, ape man and his wife from one tooth. It turned out to be a pig's tooth. Somebody said if they'd have found a whole jaw, they could have drawn a yearbook.
But here's the sad thing. This is the type of thinking and the type of evidence that they had during the Scopes trial. Have you ever heard of the famous monkey trial of Dayton, Tennessee? Have any ever seen the film Inherit the Wind? William Jennings Bryan versus Slick Order for the evolutionists. William Jennings Bryan didn't do a very good job in that trial. He didn't know some of the things that you know. And this altered the educational system in the United States so that creationists would look like pillbillies and that the educated people believed in evolution. And that's evidence one, two. Piltdown Man was discovered near Sussex, England in 1912. It was found in a gravel pit. All the evidence they had for that was a broken skull and a jaw. Now with plaster of Paris, they put in some other things to make it look complete, formulate what they think it looked like. Broken fossil skull and a jaw. It turned out this was discovered in 1912. For 40 years, the British Museum and experts concealed this from inspection. In 1953, Kenneth Oakley was able to examine this skull and this jaw. He found out they had both been chemically treated, stained to make them look old. He looked at it in the microscope and saw the filings, the teeth, where they tried to alter the shape. The whole thing was a hoax and it should have been obvious to the experts. The concealing of the data was probably a bigger scandal than the original scandal itself because for 40 years this molded public opinion that there was a Piltdown man intermediate somewhere between monkey and man. The whole thing was a hoax. You probably heard of Peking man discovered in China in the 1920s. One of the things about this, there were skulls, teeth, but almost no limb bones. And the thing that's also interesting is that between 1941 and 1945, during World War II, these original bones were lost. I put quote lost. I do not know. Nobody knows for sure whether it was lost, purposely lost to conceal the data, or it was just an accident of fate, but no longer are the original bones available. They did find out by looking at these bones, the skulls have been bashed inward. Fossil remains of humans and their tools were found at the site. This was, of course, indication that this was not a prehistoric man. One reconstruction of this skull is a famous skull called Nelly. Peking man was probably a variety of apes where they crushed the skulls in and the brains were a delicacy to eat and they, they were not intermediates between humans and apes at all. Another is one that's probably used more recently, Australopithecus afarensis. This particular skeleton was about 40% complete. They've named it Lucy. Lucy was a girl who was mentioned in a Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. It was named after the Beatles song. At best, Lucy was a form of an extinct ape. At worst, she was a combination of two or three species, in other words, bones are put together. Yet this is still touted as one of the evidences of human evolution. Probably Lucy was a variety of an extinct ape. The evidence they have for Java man was a skull cap, a thigh bone, and several teeth. There was a fellow by the name of Eugene Du Bois who went to Indonesia. His purpose was to discover the missing link and prove evolution. He found this skull cap, he found a thigh bone, several teeth. There were several things he did not reveal. He did not reveal that the thigh bone he found some 45 feet away a year later, yet he put these together. There was another thing that he failed to tell. For 30 years he concealed the fact that he had found two human skulls nearby. They're called the Wajak skulls. If he had let people know he found human skulls at the same time, nobody would have accepted his data. But he concealed it and of course became famous for that. 
But he did admit at the end of his life that it probably was belonging to a giant gibbon, which is a form of ape. Then you've heard of Neanderthal man. They found partial skeletons. First found near Neander, Germany. That's where they get the name Neanderthal man. Found in 1856. And evolutionists seized upon Neanderthal man as a missing link between apes and man. The Neanderthal man was reconstructed to show somebody who walked, stooped over, head set far forward, gave the appearance of an apish look man. It is now felt that Neanderthal man was fully human, suffering from some bone deformities which were caused by diseases. I have a, a picture of a professional wrestler who wrestled years ago. He was a Frenchman by the name of Maurice Tillet, but his professional wrestling name was the Angel. Doesn't he look like an angel? He had some features that were different from most human beings. His head and his face were very large. His hands and his feet were thickened and his torso was broadened. He was wrestling in the Boston area and some anthropologists from Harvard, one of them by the name of Carlton Kuhn, and some of his colleagues, they invited him to Harvard the next day for measurements because they looked at him and thought, this guy looks like a Neanderthal man. His measurements conformed to the Neanderthal man dimensions. But he was not any kind of prehistoric form. He was actually quite highly educated, quite cultured, but apparently he suffered from some kind of endocrine disorder, especially from the overfunctioning of the pituitary gland. Well, what did the first man look like? Did he look like some kind of knuckle-dragging creature that came out of the jungles on his four feet and, and just started to walk upright, and finally invented tools, and finally became modern man? Is that what the first man looked like? I think the Bible gives an answer to that. Adam was made in what? The image of God. Jesus is the express image of his person. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Christ is the image of God. Adam was the figure of him that was to come. God had in mind a human body when he occupied it. God fashioned Adam to look like that human body. I do not believe that Adam drug Eve by the hair. He had a club in one hand, that type of thing. That he looked scooped over and so forth. I believe he was fully formed. I don't think Adam had glasses. I don't think Adam had braces. I don't think he had him stooped over. Adam was fully formed, 32 teeth, 206 bones, 650 months. Adam looked like Jesus Christ. I've had the privilege of working with Bible schools for a long time. In my career as academic dean, it was my responsibility to get the caps and gowns ordered. And now they have more or less one size fits all, but we used to have to take the head size. The variation was amazing. When I first went to Stockton in 85, we had one fellow whose head was so big, I had never measured anybody whose head was that big, but we ordered a cap and gown. About five years later, we had another student whose head was far larger. His head was so large that his mother had to sew in a piece of blue cloth so that he could wear a cap and gown. I wouldn't doubt in this room we have some who have a head size like six and five eighths and probably have somebody with seven and a half. But these fellows were well over the eight brain. But suppose I was able to years later get all their skulls and line them up with a six and three eighths, a six and five eighths, a six and seven eighths, a seven, Seven and eight, seven and a half, seven and three quarters, and here's these big guys, eight and eight, eight and three eighths. Does that show an evolutionary pattern? No. Even if you went and you took their brain side and you lined them up in order to brain capacity, does that indicate an evolutionary order? No. They say Einstein had a very small brain, he had a small head. It isn't how big your brain is, it's how well you use it. The point I'm making is that skull size just doesn't show an evolutionary pattern. Brain size is no evidence of evolution. 
they'll try to talk about the brain capacity of Neanderthal man, the brain capacity. I don't think it has a thing to do with evolution. Again, there are some things you cannot tell from the bone fragments, teeth. You cannot tell what the ears look like. You can't tell what the mouth looks like. You can't tell what the lips look like. You can't tell what the eyes look like. The nose, the hair, or the skin fat. And so when you see a reconstruction based on one tooth, now I got your drawings here. You didn't have time to draw, but if all of you real artists and drew, you'd come up with all sorts of ideas based on your bias. If you find a thing and it's human and you want it to be an evolutionary thing, you draw it stooped over, you draw it with more hair, you draw it with a different lip thing, you find a, a monkey skull and you want to make it human, you can make it stand up more right. You can do anything you want to from a few bones. It's ridiculous, these reconstructions, trying to draw evolutionary pattern, then using their drawings to prove evolution. Now a question that might be asked is why don't we find more human fossils? If you took all the samples of Java man, Peking man, which is lost, Lucy, all those samples, you put the bone, they would all fit on one table. That's about how much evidence they have. And of course, most of them have proved to be either fraud or, or insufficient evidence. You really don't find a lot of human fossils. Why don't we find more human fossils? Billions of fossils have been discovered, but not many human fossils. Well, first of all, over 99% of all the fossils are plants or marine creatures. Now, why is that so? Well, land animals, and even lots of times fish, but it was still more apt for a fish to get buried because it's down there in the lower level. Maybe the water gets buried by sediment. But what about land animals? When that water began to rise, what did they probably do? They probably fled to higher ground. And then, as it's floating on the top of the water, the ravens, the vultures, the bacteria, and they destroy almost everything. And I think that's the reason why we don't find more human fossils. But as far as finding the intermediate the quote, missing link between apes and man, they have not found it at all. Now, why do people continue to claim to have found ancestors of humans? Well, the first thing, I have no question, the first thing for many of them is the love of money. Publications like National Geographic, which are very evolutionary oriented, they're spending big bucks supporting these fellas as they go to Kenya and some of these places. So they've got to produce. They've got to produce so that the magazines have something to show. Also, the lecture circuit can offer some pretty high rewards. So they've got to have something to show. I think also the pride of life to outdo the Leakeys or outdo the Johansons or some of these people. You know, they, they want to be famous. People want their autographs. I make a comment here, this is not the first time that people have lied or falsely witnessed for money. What did the soldiers at the time of Jesus receive money for? To say that the body was stolen and they were willing to take bribes and money. So it's not the first time. I would like to conclude with this. There are fossils of apes. There are a few fossils of men. No intermediates. Men have always been men. Apes have always been apes. And somebody else said there's also some falsely called scientists who monkey around with the evidence.